Section two of Astounding Stories twenty, August nineteen thirty one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeremiah Sutherland, Victoria, British Columbia. Astounding Stories twenty, August nineteen thirty one. The Danger from the Deep by Ralph Milne Farley, Part two. He must be dreaming for even if osborne was right about his supposed super race at the bottom of the sea this race could not be human for the pressures here would be entirely too great no human being could possibly stand two thousand pounds per square inch having satisfied their curiosity the four divers pulled themselves up onto the shelf and sat there in a row with their legs hanging over abbot glanced upward at the ceiling lights but these had become strangely blurred there seemed to be an opaque barrier above him and this barrier seemed to be slowly descending the lights blurred out completely and were replaced by a diffused illumination over the entire ripley barrier and then it dawned on the young man that this descending sheet of silver was the surface of the water he was in a lock and the water was being pumped out the surface settled about the helmets of the divers and their helmets disappeared then their shoulders and the rest of them at last it reached the level of abbot's window the divers could again be seen and among them on the shelf there stood a half dozen naked bearded men clad only in loincloths they had evidently entered the lock while the water was subsiding these men unbuckled the helmets of the divers and helped them out and then splashed down into the water and peered in through the windows of the bathysphere presently some of them left through a door at the end of the platform but soon reappeared with staging which they set up around the sphere then climbing on top they got to work on the manhole cover as george abbott realized their purpose he became frantic although these men appeared to be human just like himself yet his scientifically trained mind told them that they must be of some very special anatomical structure in order to be able to withstand the immense pressures at the bottom of the pacific it was all right for them to be out there but it would be fatal to him and then the heavy circular door above him began slowly to revolve this was terrible in a moment the crushing pressures of the depths would come seeping in rising unsteadily on his knees the young man tried with his fingers to resist the rotation of the door but it continued to turn yet no pressure could be felt the door became completely unscrewed it was pried up and slid off the top of the bathysphere to crash upon the floor outside inquisitive bearded faces peered down through the hole young abbot slumped to the cold bottom of the sphere and stared back at them he was saved incredibly saved these were real people the air was real air and he must therefore be on the surface of the earth instead of at the bottom of the pacific as he had imagined with a sigh of relief he fainted when he came to his senses again he was lying in a bed in a small room bending over him was the sweetest feminine face that he had ever seen the girl seemed to be about twenty years of age she was clad in a clinging robe of some filmy green substance her hair was honey brown short and curly and her forehead high and intelligent her eyes an indescribable shade of deep violet were matchlessly set off by her ivory skin the young man smiled up at her and she smiled back thus far it had not occurred to him to wonder where he was or why no recollection of his recent strange adventures came to him to him this was an exotic dream from which he did not care to awake she spoke her words were unintelligible and unlike any language which george abbott knew or had even heard and he was an accomplished linguist in addition to his other attainments and her words were not all that was strange about her speech for the very tones of her voice sounded completely unhuman although not displeasing her talk had a metallic ring to it like the brassy blare of temple gongs and yet was so smooth and subdued as to be sweeter than any sound that the young scientist had ever heard before beautiful dream fairy replied the enraptured young man i haven't the slightest idea what you are saying but keep right on i like it his own voice sounded crass and crude compared to hers at his first words she gave a start of surprise but thereafter the sound did not appear to grate on her ears then one of the bearded men in loincloths entered and he and the girl talked together quite evidently about their patient the man's voice had the same strange metallic quality to it as that of the girl 
but was deeper so that it had boomed with the rich notes of a bell. At the sight of the man young Abbot's memory swept back, and he remembered the adventure of his diving sphere and its capture, one mile down, by the strange shark-fish with human hands and arms. But how he had reached the surface of the earth again he couldn't figure out, nor did he particularly care. The strange man withdrew, and the girl sat down beside the bed and smiled at Abbot. He smiled back at her. Presently another girl entered and called, Millie! The girl beside the bed started, and looking up, asked some question, to which the other replied. The newcomer brought in some strange warm food in a covered dish and then withdrew. The first girl proceeded to feed her patient. After the meal, which tasted unlike anything which the young man had ever eaten before, the beautiful nurse again essayed conversation with him. She seemed perplexed and a bit frightened that he could not understand her words. Somehow the young man sensed that this girl had never heard any other language than her own, and that she did not even know that other languages existed. Strengthened by his food, he determined to set about learning her language as soon as possible. So he pointed at her and asked, Millie? She nodded, and spoke some word which he took for yes. Then he pointed to himself and said, George. She understood, but the word was a difficult one for her to duplicate in the metallic tongue of her people. She made several attempts until he laughingly spoke her word for yes. Then he pointed to other objects about the room. She gave him the names of these, but he could easily see that she felt that, if he did not know the names for all these common things, there must be something the matter with him. He wondered how he could make her understand that there were other languages in the world than her own, and then he remembered the sharks with their hands and what he had taken to be their sign language. Perhaps Millie at least knew of the existence of the sign language. This would afford a parallel, for if she realized that there were two languages in the world, might there not be three? So Abbott made some meaningless signs with his fingers. Millie quite evidently was accustomed to this kind of talk, but she was further perplexed to find that George talked gibberish with his hands as well as with his mouth. She made some signs with her hands and then said something orally. Young Abbott instantly pointed to her mouth and held up one finger, then to her hands and held up two, then to his own mouth and held up three, at the same time speaking a sentence of English. Instantly she caught on, there were three languages in the world, and thereafter she no longer regarded him as crazy. For several hours she taught him, then another meal was brought, after which she left him and the lights went out. He awakened feeling thoroughly rested and well. The lights were on and Millie was beside him. He asked for his clothes, they were brought, Millie withdrew and he put them on. After breakfast, which they ate together, one of the bearded men came and led him out through a number of winding corridors into a larger room in which there was a closed spherical glass tank about ten feet in diameter, containing one of the human sharks. Around the tank stood five of the bearded men. One of them proceeded to address Abbott, but of course the young American could not make out what he was saying. This apparent lack of intelligence seemed to exasperate the man, and finally he turned toward the tank and engaged in a sign language conference with the fish, then turned back to Abbott again and spoke to him very sternly. But Abbott shook his head and replied, Millie, bring Millie. One of the other men flashed a look of triumph at their leader and laughed. Yes, he added, bring Millie. The leader scowled at him, and some words were interchanged, but it ended in Millie being sent for. She apparently explained the situation to the satisfaction of the fish, to the intense glee of the man who had sent for her, and to the rather complete discomfiture of the leader of the five. Abbott later learned that the leader's name was Thig, and that the name of the gleeful man was Dolph. The reception over, Millie led Abbott back to his room. There ensued many days, very pleasant days, of language instruction from Millie. Dolph and Thig and others of the five came frequently to note his progress and to talk with him and ask questions. A sitting room was provided for him, adjoining his sleeping quarters. Millie occupied quarters nearby. Within a week he had mastered enough of the language of these people, for their strange history began to be intelligible to him. In spite of the fact that the air here was at merely atmospheric pressure, nevertheless this place was one mile beneath the surface of the Pacific. Millie and her people lived in a city hollowed out of a reef of rocks, reinforced against the terrific weight of the water and filled with laboratory-made air. They had never been to the surface of the sea. 
The fish with the human arms were their creators and their masters. Professor Osborne had been right. The fish of the deep, having a head start on the rest of the world, had evolved to a perfectly unbelievable degree of intelligence. Centuries ago they had built for themselves the exact analogue of George Abbott's bathysphere, and in it they had made much the same sort of exploring trips to the surface that he had made down into the deeps. But their spheres had been constructed to keep in, rather than to keep out, great pressure. Their scientists had gathered a wealth of data as to conditions on the surface, and had even seen and studied human beings. But their insatiable scientific curiosity had led them to want to know more about the strange country above them, and the strange persons who inhabited it. And so they set about breeding, in their own laboratories, creatures which should be as like as possible to those whom they had observed on the surface. Of course, this experiment necessitated their first setting up an air-filled partial vacuum similar to that which surrounds the earth. But they had persisted. They had brought down samples of air from the surface of the sea, and had analyzed and duplicated it on a large scale. Finally, through long years, they had so directed, and controlled the course of evolution in their breederies, as first to be able to produce creatures which could live in air at low pressures, and then to evolve the descendants of those creatures into intelligent human beings. Some of the lower types of this evolutionary process, both in the direct line of descent of man and among the collateral offshoots, had been retained for food and other purposes. Abbott, with intense scientific interest, studied these specimens in the zoo of the underwater city where he was staying. Plans had been in progress for some time among the fish folk and their human subjects to send an expedition to the surface, and now the shark masters had fortunately been able to secure alive an actual specimen of the surface folk namely George Abbott. The expedition was accordingly postponed until they could pump out of the young scientist all the information possible. Abbott was naturally overjoyed at the prospect. This would not only get him out of here, but think what it would mean to science. The plans of the sharks were entirely peaceful. Furthermore, there were only about two hundred of the laboratory-bred synthetic human beings, and so these could constitute no menace to mankind. Accordingly, he enthusiastically assured them that they could depend upon the hearty cooperation of the scientists of the outer earth. During all his stay so far in this cave city, Abbott had been permitted to come into contact only with Millie, the members of the Committee of Five, and an occasional guard or laboratory assistant. Yet in spite of the absence of personal contacts with other members of this strange race, Abbott was constantly aware of a background of many people and tense activity which kept the wheels of industry and domestic economy turning in this undersea city. Although the young man readily accustomed himself to the speech and food and customs of this strange race, his personal modesty and neatness revolted at the loincloths and beards of the men, and so by special dispensation he was permitted to wear his sailor suit and to shave. The Committee of Five, who constituted a sort of ruling body for the city, interviewed him at length, cross-examined him most skillfully, and took copious notes but there seemed to be a strange lack of common meeting ground between their minds and his, so that very often they were forced to call on Millie to act as an intermediary. The beautiful young girl seemed able to understand both George Abbott and the leaders of her own people with equal facility. A number of specially constructed submarines had already been built to carry the expedition to the surface. Before it came time to use them, Abbott tried to paint as glowing a picture as possible of life on Earth, but he found it necessary to gloss over a great many things. How could he explain and justify war, liquor, crime, poverty, graft, and the other evils to which constant acquaintance has rendered the human race so calloused? He was unable to deceive the men of the deep. With their superintelligence, they relentlessly unearthed from him all the salient facts, and as a result of their discoveries, their initial friendly feeling for the world of men rapidly developed into supreme contempt. But Abbott, on the other hand, developed a deep respect for them. Their chemistry and their electrical and mechanical devices amazed and astounded him. They even were able to keep sun time and tell the seasons by means of gyroscopes. Age was measured much as it is on the surface. This fact was brought to Abbott's attention by the approach of Millie's twentieth birthday. Strange to relate, she seemed to dread the approach of that anniversary and finally told Abbott the reason. It is the custom, said she, when a girl or a boy reaches twenty, to give a very rigorous intelligence test. In fact, such a test is given on every birthday, but the one on the twentieth is the hardest. 
So far I have just barely passed each test, which fact marks me as of very low mentality indeed. And if I fail this time, they will kill me, so as to make room for others who have a better right to live. Impossible, exclaimed the young man indignantly. Why, you have a better mind than those of many of the leading scientists of the outer world. All the same, she replied gloomily, it is way below standard for here. On the day of the test he did his best to cheer her up. Dolph also came, she seemed to be an especial protégé of his, and gave her his encouragement. He had been coaching her heavily for the examinations for some time previous. But later in the day she returned in tears to report to Abbott that she had failed, and had only twenty-four hours to live. Before he realized what he was doing, Abbott had seized her in his arms, and was pouring out to her a love which up to that moment he had not realized existed. Finally her sobbing ceased, and she smiled through her tears. "'George, dear,' said she, "'it is worth dying to know that you care for me like this.' "'I won't let them kill you,' asserted the young man belligerently. "'They owe me something for the assistance which I am to give them on their expedition. I shall demand your life as the price of my cooperation. Besides, you are the only one of all your people who has brains enough to understand what I tell them about the outer earth. It is they who are weak-minded, not you.' but she sadly shook her head. "'It would never do for you to sponsor me,' said she, "'for it would alienate my one friend in power, Dolph. "'He loves me. No, don't scowl, for I do not love him. "'But for the safety of both of us, "'we must not let him know of our love, yet.' "'Yet,' exclaimed Abbot, "'when you have less than a day to live?' "'You have given me hope,' the girl replied, "'and also an idea.' "'Dolph promised to appeal to the other members of the five. I have just thought of a good ground for his appeal, namely my ability to translate your clumsy description into a form suited to the high intelligence of our superiors. Clumsy, exclaimed the young man, a bit nettled. Oh, pardon me, dear, I'm so sorry, said she contritely. I didn't mean to let it slip, and now I must rush to Dolph and tell him my idea. Don't let him make love to you, though, admonished Abbot gloomily. She kissed him lightly and fled. A half hour later she was back, all smiles. The idea had gone across big. Dolph, as the leader of the projected expedition, had demanded that Milly be brought along as liaison officer between them and their guide, and the other four committee men had reluctantly acceded. The execution was accordingly indefinitely postponed. The young couple spent the evening making happy plans for their life together on the outer earth, for as soon as they should arrive in America, Dolph would have no further hold over them. The next day the committee of five announced that, for a change, they were going to give George Abbott an intelligence test. He had represented himself as being one of the scientists of the outer earth. Accordingly, they could gauge the caliber of his fellow countrymen by determining his IQ. Milly was quite agitated when this program was announced, but the ordeal held no terrors for George Abbott. Had he not taken many such tests on earth and passed them easily? So he appeared before the committee of five with a rather cocky air. He had yet to see an intelligence test too tricky for him to eat alive. Start him with something easy, suggested Dolph. Perhaps they don't have tests on the outer earth. You know, one gains a certain facility by practice. Millie didn't, in spite of all the practicing which you gave her, maliciously remarked Fig. Dolph glowered at him. "'What is the cube root of 378?' suddenly asked one of the other members of the committee. "'Oh, a little over seven, hazarded Abbott. "'Come, come,' boomed Thig. "'Give it to us exactly. "'Well, 7.2, I guess. "'Don't guess. Give it exact to four decimal places.' "'In my head?' asked Abbott incredulously. "'Certainly,' replied Thig. "'Even a child could do that. "'We're giving you easy questions to start with.' Start him on square root, suggested Dolph kindly. Remember, he isn't used to these tests like our people are. So they tried him with square root, in which he turned out to be equally dumb. Abstract questions of physics and chemistry he did better on, but the actual quantitative problems which they expected him to solve in his head stumped him completely. Then they asked him about education on earth and the qualifications for becoming a scientist, and who were the leaders in his field and what degrees they held, and what one had to do to get those degrees, etc. Finally they dismissed him. Dolph then sent for Milly. She was gone about an hour, and returned to Abbott wide-eyed and incredulous. "'Oh, George,' said she, lowering her voice, "'Dolph tells me that your intelligence is below that of a five-year-old child. 
Perhaps that is why you and I get along so well together. We are both morons. End of section two.